Good morning. Just want to make a quick announcement. Today we're beginning a new teaching series, just simply called, How Bad Do You Want It? And uh, so make sure you stay tuned in for that. And uh, it'll be online, of course, all week. And share it on Facebook. Get it out there to, to people. Please downline this kind of thing. It's going to be very helpful to them. Now, we've got some cool things. We're, a lot of live things starting to come back at the church. So, Linda, we've got a few things happening. Exactly. Um, I'm very excited about it all. Uh, on Monday night, we have our CR, our Celebrate Recovery Group, it meets here at the church at 6.30. Tuesday night, we have Stronger for Men. And uh, then we have... We are putting in our junior youth, or our senior youth. So Tuesday night is senior youth here at The Reach. Just come and meet at The Reach at 6.30 till 8.30 and bring your bike. Yeah, and so the youth are firing up. So Ex Tuesday night, senior. So exciting. Wednesday night, junior. I am excited about it. And uh, then Tuesday, Stronger Men, Stronger Women Thursday. So just reiterating all of those. Next Sunday, two live services. I believe we'll be having communion. So mm -hmm. just know that that will probably be something coming off next uh, weekend. Uh, the family service. Did we talk about the we family service? We haven't yet. We need to talk about the family this service. This is an exciting addition to our, our services for the week. Um, we have a family service, and that's for a parent or a guardian and a child or children uh, ages 5 to 11 to meet at the REACH on Sunday mornings from 10 to 10.30. It's called 30-Minute Mission. And uh, so it's kind of in between services. The first one will end sometime right at 10. But they are doing their own thing there. And so it's Pastor Angela and, uh, and Faye from The Reach are partnering up to make this happen. It's going to be a wonderful event for your kids. Of course, with all of the, the things that we need to do at this time in protection, exactly. uh, we'll be a part of that. Now, um, this also Thursday, Friday, we have another cool thing happening. We are opening the Reach Cafe for a short time from 4 o'clock to 7 o'clock on Thursday and Friday. And you can pre-order uh, uh, some of our menu items. Uh, we will give you a list of what's uh, available online and also, I'm sure, on Facebook, etc. And you can pre-order as you need to do that. And we will have curbside pick up and or come in and pick it up and we are excited we are bringing back some of our most popular items yeah we are and yeah just take note but it'll give you directions online it it is a pickup and uh, and uh, you have to pre-order online or f through Facebook or like any which way yeah. you can. Uh, basically, it's all there for you. So lots of little things firing up, but all good things. Yes. Um, would you just keep the church in your prayers and uh, that uh, God would just help us through this time when the, we're re-engaging again uh, a little bit with things. And uh, so as much as you're comfortable, be a part of these things. And let's see God's work continue to go ahead. Enjoy the rest of the morning. Good morning. Welcome to People's Church. Thanks for tuning in online. We're happy to be in your home. And this is actually week two that we're starting to open up and people are starting to come to our live services. So we hope to see you soon. And But in the meantime, enjoy this service and know that God is still good. He still sits on the throne. He's still in control. And we're just here this morning to worship the Lord Jesus Christ together. We hope you enjoy it.
Wandering in darkness No life inside No hope inside But he called my name He healed my blindness Set me ablaze Now I'm alive with There's love breaking through my heart of stone Love breathing to awake my bones Love reaching out to save my soul Love never gonna let me go And now my heart So full of worship I can't hold back I can't contain it For all he's done Jesus my Savior
Dressed in his righteousness alone Faultless stand before the throne Christ alone Cornerstone Weak made strong In the Savior's love through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of I'd like to take a moment to introduce to you one of our team members. Uh, you've probably seen him up here. If you haven't seen him here at Peoples, then you've seen him on the wall at the uh, Can what a Canada Revolution Place. Used to be the Canada Games Arena. You had beautiful hair back then, Mark. Long, flowing locks. Oh yeah. Well, you still have good hair. But this is Mark Malakoff. He's one of our bass players here, and uh, he's uh, he's been married for just about 12 years to Stephanie. He's got two beautiful daughters. And uh, something about Mark is, well, he's, he's ambitious about hockey, but he's ambitious about a lot of things. Mark, he went to uh, college down in the States, Michigan Tech School, uh, for finance. With go Huskies. Uh, he took finance there, and, and when he got back, he found it, it wasn't quite a fit for him. So Mark just went with, and did what any one of us would do. He just went and started four companies from scratch. So he's running three right now, but he began four. And Mark, it's, uh, whether you're uh, running our HMI camps here uh, through Peoples or uh, playing, like you, you didn't even learn the bass until you were an adult, right? So this guy just, I admire what you do, man, uh, and appreciate you being a part of our team, not just for your music skills, but for who you are. Now this next song we're gonna do, uh, I don't know, I think, I think we can draw from who Mark is. It's, this song's about ambition. And there's a lot of stuff going on out there. But God's call remains the same for us. And that is that he is in control and he wants us to share his love with the world. So this song really is about being ambitious and just sharing the name of Jesus, getting the name out there. Anywhere that Jesus' name is lifted high, things grow, things move forward. Things are fresh. So enjoy this song that Ethan's going to sing called I Speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus Over every heart and every mind I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus, your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life, break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn light.
from the mountains and Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. And Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. And Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. morning. In my life, there's been a question that I've had to answer over and over and over again for every challenge that I have, every dream that I have, every vision that I've ever had for my life. There's always been the same question that's going to determine the outcome. And I want to talk to you about that today because I think it can help you in these times and at all times. In fact, we're going to start a series today over a few weekends that's going to deal with this particular question. And this question is, how bad do you want it? I've had to ask myself that question a lot of times. Whenever I go down any new journey or any adventure or any new path, It's always, how bad do you want it? Because there's always those test moments and points that come repetitively into every adventure, every challenge, every dream, every vision that says, how bad do you really want this? Because all of a sudden, it's not just the easy road of going from A to B. The challenges of life require a a, a very strong response from inside of us. And this question measures that. This question lets us know to what degree we are going to be successful in the things that we're trying to build, rescue, renovate, restore, start from scratch, whatever it is. This question lets you know the degree of strength that you're going to have in the journey ahead. How bad do you want it? How bad do you want to be out of debt? How bad do you want to uh, be married? How bad do you want a good marriage? How bad do you want to start that new career? How bad do you want to build that business? How bad do you want to take the next step or the next layer up? How bad do you want it? That's such a critical question that we have to ask ourselves. And what I found, That if I don't nurture that in me, the desire, the want to, 
man, I never seem to finish or complete the dream, the vision, what I really want. I was talking to somebody recently, and they noticed the artist renderings of this particular building. And they were talking about just pretty neat, what a journey, you know, to build that. And I was started to reflect immediately upon, you know, I had to want this really bad. This was something that as a church, we had to want really bad. I think about that time and what it cost us for us to be able to go ahead to the next phase of what God's plan and vision was for us. It's always going to task you. And so you better be able to answer this question with a strong degree of affirmation. I want this bad. Jesus told us to have faith like a children. Sometimes we think that's simple. I think it's persistent. I've got grandkids. I've got a kid that has obviously children. I, I am used to this. When I grew up, it was the same way. Every child is very persistent. They, they, they don't give up on the first no. Have you figured that out yet? They don't even give up on the seventh no often. And you finally have to say, no, I really mean no. It's that kind of persistence of how bad that we want something that gets us from A to B in life too. So I, we're going to talk about this over the next weeks. I, I want to bring one of my favorite stories into this. And uh, it's about Moses and the children of Israel after they have miraculously left Egypt. And now they've been two years on the journey. They've received the uh, law of God, the Ten Commandments from the Mount Sinai. And now they are at the edge of the promised land. Now, this has been a dream and a vision in this nation for hundreds of years. They've been in Egypt over 400 years. And now they can almost taste it. We are free. In the first phase of getting free, all the work had to be done by God with all of the plagues to release them. But now the work as they, if they want their land, that's going to have to be done by them. God with them, God helping them, God leading them. But now they're required to have a faith that is wanting this bad. So this taste for freedom and taste for their own land has been building for generations. And now finally, this generation stands on this amazing opportunity after being in slavery for hundreds of years. Now they stand on the precipice of building the life they've always wanted. You may be there in different areas of your life right now. These times may have put you in places like this, but I will tell you that right now, God's going to require from you an answer to this question. How bad do you want it? So what Moses does is he sends 12 men on a mission trip, a vision trip. That's what it is. More than a mission trip, a vision trip. He wants them to go and spy out the land. Let me just read this particular section for you from Numbers 13. Moses gave the men these instructions as he sent them out to explore the land. Go north through the Negev into the hill country. See what the land is like and find out whether the people living there are strong or weak, few or many. See what kind of land they live in. Is it good or bad? Do their towns have walls or are they unprotected like open camps? Is the soil fertile or poor? Are there many trees? Do your best to bring back some samples of the crops you see. It just happened to be the season for harvesting the first ripe grapes. This is the vision trip. Now, after exploring the land for 40 days, the men returned. To Moses, Aaron, and the whole community of Israel at Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran. Notice their location. They're in the wilderness. They're in the in-between land. They're not in Egypt. They're not in Canaan. They're in the in-between land. They're not where they were. They're not where their vision is to be. That's where you may be many times in your life. In fact, you will be. And this question is going to come front and center at all of those times. How bad do you want it? You're in between where you were and where you want to be in that marriage. You're in between where you were and where you want to be in your finances, in your ministry, in your service to God, in your health, in being in shape, in anything. 
There's always the in-between land. And that's where they are. They're in the wilderness. They reported to the whole community what they had seen and showed them the fruit that they had taken from the land. So here's a pretty cool thing. They get to go on this vision trip. They, for 40 days, every morning get up in the new land. They're the first ones. These are the pioneers. These are the 12 that are going out there to check it all out. One from each of the tribes. And they come back, and you think they come back and say, this is amazing, let's get up, let's grab our weapons, let's go, God with us, let's take this thing. Doesn't quite work out that way, see? Because 10 of them didn't want it bad enough. Two of them did. Two of them did. They wanted it bad. You see, what you see is what you get. And these kind of questions allow us to get a proper perspective on really how bad do we want something? How much are we really willing to put in for this? How much sweat? How much tears? How much, how much work? How much, how, much, how much just to journey the weight of it? How much are we willing to put in? Jesus said, you know, before you build the tower, count the cost. Well, you're crazy if you don't. Before you go to war... Make sure you're able to, you know, have enough guys to defeat the enemy. In this particular thing, we see that what some of these guys saw was a real mixed bag. And there were two that saw it right because they knew what they wanted very clearly. It goes on and it says with this that, that they, they come back and they've got this mixed report. We're going to look at that in just a moment, but hear this. If you want to escape your current reality, wherever you are in the in-between land, if you're in the in-between land, by the way, it was desert. It's not a lot of, you know, you don't build there. You don't move in there. It's something you move through. And this is the way God works with us. He starts us on a path. He gives us a vision where he wants us to go, a dream that we're building. You might have a dream to get married. You might have a dream to have children. You might have a dream to start your own business. You might have ministry dreams of service to God. Whatever those dreams are, he starts you off sort of in the Egypts of our life and calls us out. And we come out, but we end up in a place where he doesn't want you to root, but you got to go through because that's where your faith will be tested. This is where your character is going to be built. This is where the strength is going to be laid in. This is where you're going to experience God in a different way. The in-between land. I know some of you are thinking, man, my whole life seems to be an in-between land. Well, in a sense it is. Because the ultimate arrival in Canaan or promised land is heaven. But thank God he's got some Canaans for us in this world. Places where the will of God can be done. Where the kingdom of God is going to be, like in our homes and just even starting in our own lives. Where his rule is really there. So when we are talking about vision, this is the escape of current realities. First, Egypt, moving off to Canaan, but getting to the in-between land. Now, as these 12 spies had looked at their final destination, where the vision was to take them, we find that 10 of them had an issue. Now, I want to talk to you about symptoms of, of a fearful future. When you see the future in a fearful way, and if you don't want it bad enough to corral those fears. You don't want it bad enough to step out beyond those fears. You don't want it bad enough to take the steering wheel back from those fears. You have a fearful future. And it's going to bring these symptoms. Six deadly symptoms of a fearful future. Number one, you're going to experience stress that's caused by conflicting pictures. Look at their report in verse 27 of 13 and 28. This was their report to Moses. We enter the land you sent us to explore. Oh, and it is indeed a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here is the kind of fruit it produces, and they're carrying a, a grape a vine thing that had that, that a cluster that had to be carried by two men. Imagine this. Imagine that. But then you see this. But the people living there are powerful 
And their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. You got to see in this report two conflicting pictures. One picture, they're saying it's absolutely what God said it is. God is right. God was accurate. He didn't lie to us. It's a great land. It's got all of this. And then they come to the second picture, which is, but there are these guys and these guys in walled cities, and here's the obstacles, here's the challenges. They are being confronted with this question, how bad do you want it? Those two pictures are tied together by one very key preposition. But, but, Yes, God is accurate. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. It's bountiful. It, it, here's the fruit it produces. It's amazing. But the people living there are powerful. But the challenges are great. But, but the biggest problem that's going to keep you from experiencing God is your big butts. But, but. Everybody has a but. I could do this, but. I know God wants me to do this, but. I know it's the right thing to do, but. Everybody has a but. Some buts are bigger than other buts. I can always see your butt, but I can't see my own butts. And it is those buts that keep you from becoming all God wants you to be. But, 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 but. I can't do it. You've got to let go of the big butts in your life. I hope you're having fun. But seriously, those joiners that bring the conflicting picture to the God picture, and all of a sudden you've got this wonderful God picture he's painted for you, and then you equal that picture with your own fearful picture that says there are walled cities, there are giants, there are obstacles. I, 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 we can't do it. We can't build this family. We can't build this relationship. We can't rebuild this business. It's a beautiful place. But there's some enemy in there. There's some enemy in there. It's true. The second deadly symptom of this is scarcity. Scarcity thinking. This is where we begin to really look at it and say there's not room for everybody. It's kind of like the Costco toilet paper issue. It's kind of like at the beginning of this particular season of COVID-19. We had all kinds of people loading up carts of paper goods, toilet paper, because somebody else was doing it. Scarcity. There won't be enough. There won't be enough. That comes out of this scripture. The Amalekites live in the Negev, and the Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country. The Canaanites live along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and along the Jordan Valley. What is he saying here? What they're saying is it's occupied. The enemy's everywhere. There's no room for us. It's scarcity. We can't, every, all the land is taken by, by, by all the enemy. This is, this is a problem in many, many people's thinking. We begin to think that there's no room for us, and we begin to hoard what little that we've got. I don't have enough. I, I, I shouldn't expand. I shouldn't take any risk. I'm going to batten down the hatches. I'm going to hold on. This is scarcity thinking. It's a horrible way to be thinking. Because when you think this way, you are placing yourself into a place where you become survival-oriented, and that means it's become about me. Imagine if God was just about himself. 
Jesus came and became our servant. Imagine if he had scarcity thinking. Scarcity. There's not enough to go around. Yeah, there will be, and there is. And when we begin to realize that, we're going to be able to relax and go at life and take on the challenges and cut out the space that God has ordained that we should have. God will look after you. You know, scarcity is thinking is saying, all the good jobs are gone. How am I ever going to find a job in this economy? All the good men are gone. How am I ever going to get married? Have you ever tried to find a good woman today? Scarcity thinking. Scarcity thinking. The third symptom that's going to come in is uh, what you would call self-defeating uh, prophecies. We've all got these. We all have these things in which we look at ourselves in a way that really says, um, wow, I can't do that. We have all of these ways of thinking when we think about scarcity. Scarcity. Self-defeating. Self-defeating. And look at the scripture. But the other men who had explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. They are stronger than we are. That's a self-defeating prophecy. They are stronger than we are. The person, you know, here, here's a true statement. The person who says we can do it and the person who says we can't do it are both right. What are you prophesying over yourself? What are you prophesying over your family? What are you prophesying over your, finance, your finances? What are you speaking to yourself? What word from God are you speaking? Or is it a word from God? You might be your own little self-defeating prophecy. I can't. We can't. You can't. I'm always really careful when I have... My grandchildren talk to me, and they're talking about something about what they can or can't do or something they'd like to do. And sometimes I find in myself, I want to come out and say, well, you can't do that. I think we start, got to start speaking we cans to ourselves and to those around us. We can do this. We will do this. There's always going to be things stronger than you are, and that's why you need God. That's why it was a God vision. You're going to go into my, this land. I've got this land prepared for you. You're not going in there alone. You're going in there with me. Another thing that happens is a deadly symptom of this is, is we become a source of negative infection. Negative infection. You see, uh, the Bible says that in Numbers 13, 32, that they spread this bad report about the land amongst the Israelites. They said, the land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge, which is not true. They became an infection that was negative for everybody else. They stirred it up. They created a group thing. Fear does that. Anger does that. It's always looking to group. It's very infectious. It's an infection that's hard to resist, but you got to be healthy. And the only thing that, that's going to help you resist that is that you can be, yes, I can do this. Yes, with God's help, we will do this. Number five is we see ourselves as inadequate before the challenges. We just look at ourselves and then we measure the challenge. So it says in Numbers 13, 32, so they spread this bad report among the land, uh, about the land among the Israelites. And they said, the land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers. And that's what they thought too. We measure ourselves and we say we're inadequate against this particular challenge. I don't know about you, but it seems most of the challenges are, uh, I have in my life are beyond me. The, even the simple challenge that you'd think would be simple, like to turn a kid around. To help somebody else turn around. 
These challenges are always beyond our adequacies. But they focused on themselves and saw grasshoppers. And then they did what people do. You see, when we have this kind of fear of, uh, and of, inadequ- of inadequacy, what we do is we project that onto others. And we say, well, that's the way they see us too. I'm not very attractive. That's how everybody sees me. I'm not very smart. That's how everybody sees me. I'm not very talented. That's how everybody sees me. You're projecting. You have a fear that's wrong. You are, you are focusing on your own inadequacies. And you're taking the wrong kinds of measurements. And you are projecting onto others this kind of thing. That's a problem. Have you ever noticed that when you worry about something, it gets bigger? And when you look at yourself, and then you look at the challenge, and you begin to worry about that gap, and the more and more you have probably made yourself a lot smaller than you actually are, and at the same time, you're going to be making the enemies and the challenges bigger than they are. That's called projection. We project it. And we're facing a giant problem simply because we ourselves willed it and worried it into being. I couldn't be a good husband. I can never do that. I couldn't be a godly man. I couldn't make it in that business. I could never succeed at that. When you project your fears onto other people, you are really taking over the design of God And God has designed you with the things he wants. And who are you to say that that's not enough in the hands of God to do what God wants to do? You are projecting and you need to stop doing that. It is your own eyes of fear that have caused you to miss what other people see. You're saying, they see me this way. They see me this way. That's your own eyes, not theirs. Not theirs. And the sixth thing is I make myself miserable. Well, that's almost a given, isn't it? I mean, if you're going to get caught up in the type of thinking that we're talking about here, stinking thinking, I guess you could call it, you're going to be in a place where you're going to get really, really miserable. It says in 14.1 of Numbers, then the whole community began weeping aloud and they cried all night. Their voices rose in a great chorus of protest against Moses and Aaron. If only we had died in Egypt or even here in the wilderness, they complained. I would say 99% of the time that we're miserable, we did it to ourselves. Maybe it's even 100. I make myself miserable. If you're a miserable person, you're making yourself miserable. And we do that because of the fear that can grip our hearts insecurities about uh, taking on new challenges, fears of failure or rejections. You're making yourself miserable. Now, there is a way out and there is a way in. Here's your way out and here's your way in. And the first, the first way in and the first, when I say out, it means out of the wilderness. Let's get out of this in-between land and get into Canaan. And here is your way. You get out and you get into Canaan. First is trust. Trust. Don't trust your own heart. Trust God's. Don't trust your own strength. Trust God's. Don't trust your own wisdom. Trust God's. Don't trust your own little vision. Trust God's. Because if God's led you here, if he's put you with this lady, if he's put you with this man, if he's given you these children, if he made you a father or a mother, if he has put you in a business, if he has led you into the profession that you're in, that is something you trust God's leadership and his plan, and he will be the resource you need in those in-between lands, in all of those challenges of life. Trust. The second, obey. Obey. Yes, you got it. You remember the old hymn? Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. 
Obey means do whatever God tells me to do. If he's saying, let's go into the land. Yeah, there's walled cities. Yes, there are some guys of some stature and size. Let's go. This is the land. I brought you out of Egypt. Now you have to decide how bad you want it. Canaan's waiting. It's ready. It's sitting there to be taken in all these areas of your life. But it will require obedience from you. And that's faith. Because you can't be obedient if you won't have faith. And you'll never be obedient if you don't want it bad enough. And the height and the tension, or I should say the, the, the uh, strength of your faith, is always determined by your obedience. Are you ready to obey him finally? Are you ready to take the next step and say, I'm not just going to have a faith that just sits over here. It's going to cause an action. I'm going to take steps. I'm going to make some movement. I'm going to go after where God's leading is. I'm going to make the hard decisions. I'm going to take where the go in the direction he's called me to go. I'm going to quit going in this direction. I'm going to turn this direction. I don't know what your situation may be. I don't know your in-between land. I only can tell you that Canaan is going to require your steps now. Let's wind up this story. Kind of end sad. The whole nation, except for two men. Meaning, they just decided the in-between land is where they'll die. And that whole generation over, over 20 years of age and up did. In the wilderness. And a new generation was raised up 38 years later. That finally would cross the Jordan, finally would go take on the walled cities and the giants, finally would do it. Don't miss your opportunity. Trust and obey. How bad do you want it? Have a great day.